Now that we've seen um, a few ODEs, uh, just sort of in an abstract context and gotten an idea of what it means to find a solution to an ODE, I thought I'd answer the question of where do ODEs come from? And I'm going to go through a few examples. In this screencast, I'm going to talk about um, a, a very old source of ODEs, which is um, classical physics. And uh, I think the best way to start talking about this is to just watch a movie. This is interesting. You would think this would fall faster than this, wouldn't you? And you'd be absolutely right. So what did we see there? Um, uh, so Rosencrantz stumbled upon an observation, and that is if you take two objects, one larger and one smaller, and you drop them at the same time, he noted that they landed at just about the same time. Not exactly a precision experiment, but um, that's uh, the artistic liberty in the play and movie. So, um, <laughs> So he conjectures that if he takes that same heavier object and drops a feather, that the same thing will happen. And he'll find that surprisingly the feather hits the ground at the same time as the lead ball, uh, but it doesn't. And we sort of have an intuitive understanding of why that is. Um, and this is really uh, a, a contrast between Newton's law of motion uh, let's see, I think it's Newton's third law, second law of motion, Newton's second law of motion, and Aristotle's. Law of motion. Now, I think it was Aristotle's first law of motion. I'm not gonna write the numbers down because I don't remember which one is which. That's all on Wikipedia. Okay, so, uh, so Newton's law of motion says that an object experiencing a force will accelerate at a rate proportional to that force. And the constant of proportionality is its mass. So the larger the mass, the slower the acceleration. But with an object falling uh, near the Earth's surface, the force is mass times a gravitational constant. Now, if you want to ask a physicist a tricky question that I have never gotten a good answer to is why is the mass that the Earth feels and pulls on the same as the inertial mass of an object? Um, I'll leave that to you to answer and tell me about it sometime. Okay, so what this says is that the acceleration of the object is equal to um, g, and the acceleration is the second derivative, so it's x double prime, and that's equal to g. So without yet even solving this equation, x double prime equal g, um, we can see that the gravitational constant matters in terms of determining how long it takes for the object to fall, but the mass has dropped out. And so we could solve this by taking two antiderivatives, and you've probably seen this before. In this case, we know that x of t will be 1 half g t squared plus some initial velocity times t plus an initial position, vertical position. So, and that's, you see, totally independent of M, so it doesn't matter how big the object that you're dropping, uh, though, though it'll always land at the same time if it starts at the same height and is always at, at very close to the surface of the Earth. Okay, so uh, Aristotle's law of motion. Um, Aristotle observed that the velocity was proportional to the weight of an object 
and uh, and and that that weight we know is given by the mass times the gravitational constant at the surface of the Earth, and so what that means is we have an x prime that's the velocity is equal to, and I'm just going to put in some alpha times m g. Now this whole thing is just a constant as far as position is concerned, and so we can take a single antiderivative of that, and we get x of t is equal to alpha times m times g t plus x naught. And so here you can see that the time it takes, if you were to solve to find a time for it to drop a certain height, you would see that that formula would necessarily have an m involved in it somewhere. And so Aristotle would have predicted that the mass does influence the time it takes for the object to fall. So uh, let's try and unify these two theories into a single one. And I'm, I think I'm going to declare Newton the winner here because what Newton actually said, and I didn't write it out really carefully in full or say it in full, but he said that the mass times the acceleration of an object is determined by the sum of the forces acting on it. And in this case, in, in, in fact, both of these cases, there are two forces that we should really be considering. Um, one of them is a gravitational force. So um, I'm actually going to, so here I, I had a bit of a reference frame issue. I'm going to define up to be positive so that um, the gravitational force should be negative m times g. And I also want to account for a frictional force of the object moving through air, which is a, called the drag force. Now for the feather falling, what I'm going to write down is not quite accurate. Um, but if we had, let's say, uh, two balls of different size or shape that we were dropping through water, that would be a more of an accurate scenario for the model I'm about to write down. So what I'm going to write down is minus mu times v. And what I, what I, how I interpret that is if the velocity of the object is downward, so this is just my reference frame here, upward is positive. And so if the velocity of the object is downward, I want the force acting on it to be upward. So I take a negative and I multiply it by some constant mu, which we call, which we call the drag coefficient, and then multiply by v. If the velocity is upward, this is force of drag here, then I want the drag force to oppose it because the drag force should always oppose. And in this case, again, I want to have a negative mu times v because that'll allow the force to point in the opposite direction of the velocity. So no matter which way the velocity is pointing, this expression gives me the right orientation. And so here's the model that I'm, I'm really interested in. So let's replace the, um, the uh, a and v by what we know they can be replaced by, which is x double prime, so mass times acceleration x double prime is equal to minus mg minus mu x prime. And I can bring all the x terms over to one side, which is sort of a standard format for ODEs, and I see that I have a second order a linear ODE with an inhomogeneous term over here minus mg, and the coefficients in front of these are constants. So if you flip forward through um, the course outline or the learning goals, you'll see that this is going to come up in a few weeks. Uh, this is a second order differential, linear differential equation with constant coefficients, and it's an inhomogeneous one. So we will learn how to solve that. Now, how does this reconcile the two different laws of motion? Well, um, so first I'm going to just rescale this or just divide through by m and I get over mu over m times x prime equal minus g. And now if mu over m is really small, so if mu over m is much smaller, I use a double inequality to just indicate a sort of loose meaning of something is very close to zero. It's much smaller than one. So if this then the equation of motion becomes x double prime equal minus g. And that's Newton's prediction, or that's the projectile motion prediction. I don't know if Newton necessarily uh, ignored the mu terms, but when we think about projectile motion, we do, at least in a high school physics class. And then if mu over m is 
It's a little subtle how I write this. I'm going to write it as much bigger than one. In other words, it's a large number, but there's a more formal or careful way of doing these approximations that I won't talk about here. Um, then we get that um, the x double prime term has a very small coefficient relative to this one and you can multiply through by m over mu to sort of have see that come out but what you end up with is x prime is equal to minus m g over mu and that is Aristotle's observation so overall we're left with in the general case, we're left with this differential equation right here, which is going to be a little bit more complicated than either of those two scenarios to solve.